The next thing that we'll discuss is community biology. As a reminder, community biology is looking at the interaction of species, and there's tons of different types of interactions, positive ones, negative ones, and kind of neutral ones. Remember that communities do not include abiotic factors, which is what our ecosystems and our um, or looking at the biosphere includes. Uh, but this is looking across species. And it's really easy to think of interactions between animal and animals, but this could be between fungi and animals. This could be between uh, plants and bacteria. We've actually learned about a lot of these interactions in this course, uh, but this um, lecture video just kind of focuses on those interactions and then introduces a bunch of different types of examples as well. So the first type of community interaction we'll talk about is mutualism. So with mutualism, both organisms in that relationship are benefiting from being in that relationship with one another. So the first one uh, is very specific in this picture. This is a, a eel and a shrimp. Um, I'm keeping the words generic just because there's tons of different eels and tons of different shrimps um, that have this relationship with one another. And in this relationship, we have the shrimp. Uh, some of them are called cleaner shrimp. And what they literally do is with fish, such as this eel, the eel has its mouth open and the shrimp is going in and just kind of picking stuff off of it. Uh, you could almost think of it like going to the dentist. But the shrimp is benefiting because that's, that's food for the shrimp. And then for this organism like this eel, I mean, it's benefiting because it's getting these teeth cleaned. Um, if you think about your teeth, if there's a lot of bacteria buildup, if there's parasites or whatnot, that could be something that reduces your lifespan. So in this case, both of these organisms are benefiting. And before moving on, I'd actually like you to take a look at this video. I don't watch the whole thing. I watch it from two minutes and nine seconds to four minutes and 43 seconds. This is going to show you more examples. So there's tons of these type of cleaner organisms that are cleaning other fish organisms. So it's not just the cleaner shrimp and the eel. Um, there's tons of fish that are cleaner fishes. If you guys, it's kind of old at this point, ever watched the movie, I think it's called um, A Shark's Tale, and it's about a car wash which is a cleaning station. It's actually modeled after real life cleaning stations in the ocean where large fish like these eels go in order to get cleaned by these smaller fish. So go ahead and pause here. The video link is popping up. Again, don't watch the whole video. Um, watch kind of like this two, three minute clip. So pause here, watch this video, and then come back. So really cool. I think the cleaner stations are just so fascinating. Uh, and if you guys are interested in snorkeling or whatnot, I mean, they're so common. You could totally find them uh, if you were to go snorkeling. Another example of a mutualism is across kingdoms. So this cleaner example was within the animal kingdom. But let's take a look at something that goes across kingdoms. So here we have this ant and we have um, this tree. And I will spell it, they're going to say it in the video, um, but they're going to say this word acacia a lot. So I think it's like the acacia plant and the bullhorn acacia tree or just no acacia. So the acacia ant and the acacia tree. And this one's a little bit different. Uh, in this case, the, the ants are acting as a defense mechanism for this acacia tree. This tree, like other plants, is competing with others for sunlight, for space, for nutrients, for water, and also to just avoid being predated upon. But if we have these ant predators, if a grasshopper lands and tries eating it, if uh, another plant starts growing on it, these ants come to the defense of this tree. But the ants get something out of it as well. So here you see uh, one of these thorns on the tree. They're actually hollow in the inside and the ants actually go in there and that's where they reproduce. Uh, they also are getting a lot of nutrition from the tree. And all of those are really great examples. You can actually find that in the YouTube video. Uh, so this is it for mutualism. This is just another example looking between the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom. Before moving on to the next interaction, go ahead and pause here. Watch the link that is popping up that shows you a more intimate look at the acacia plant and the acacia ant. 
Awesome. So really cool interaction uh, between these two organisms and something that you may not have really expected. The next example that we'll take a look at is commensalism. And with commensalism, we see that in these relationships, one organism is clearly benefiting, uh, is getting some sort of perk in that association, whereas the other organism isn't really affected. It's not positively affected. It's not negatively affected. It's just like, eh. So let's show a couple examples. So the first one, uh, we have this huge humpback whale. And you've probably noticed this on humpback whales or sea turtles as well is they have lots and lots of barnacles on them. And we've learned before barnacles are a crustacean, and these barnacles are growing on the whale. But it's not like barnacles have roots or something. The barnacles are not taking nutrients from the whale. They're not um, taking water or food or anything away from the whale. They're literally just growing on it. Barnacles, uh, like other organisms uh, that are well, they have a shell, but it's a different shell. But like organisms that have shells, need a hard place to grow. They can't grow and develop on, say, mud or sand. This is why we find barnacles on boats and on docks and on very hard surfaces like whales or sea turtle shells. And so these barnacles just need somewhere to attach to. Again, they're not pulling nutrients or anything. They just need an attachment point. So they're benefiting because they're getting a habitat. Now this whale, on the other hand, or the sea turtle, on the other hand, it's not really impacting it, right? They're not losing nutrients. I, I guess you could argue there's an added weight, but if you look at this humpback whale, the weight of these barnacles are not going to impact it. Uh, it's not preventing the whale from eating, from swimming, or anything like that. So the whale just kind of unaffected. Another example um, is taking a look at this sponge. Uh, so remember, sponges are animals. And then here we have, it is a sea star. It's a different kind of sea star than maybe what you're thinking of. It's called a brittle star. Depending on the species, depends on how many legs it is. But they're, they're all kind of related to one another. And in this case, this brittle star is just kind of hanging out in this sponge. It's not eating the sponge. More than likely, it was using the sponge as a hiding spot. So the sponge is providing some sort of habitat for this brittle star, but the brittle star isn't eating it, it's not harming it, it's also not giving the sponge anything. So the sponge is, is unaffected, but the brittle star is, is getting protection from the sponge. Typically with commensalisms, the examples that are kind of the best defined in the scientific world is the organism that is not affected is typically providing some sort of habitat for the other organism uh, and that other organism benefiting because they have this habitat to live in, to hide from predators from, etc. So I don't have any videos for this one. Um, there's tons of examples, but if you can find an organism providing habitat to another, more than likely it's going to be commensalism. The next category that we'll talk about is parasitism. So we've talked about parasitisms before when we were talking about our roundworms and about some of our flatworms. And what a parasite is, is it's one organism either living in, such as our tapeworms, or on, maybe fleas or ticks, um, on another organism. And it gives nutrients from it. Now, people typically think of parasites as animal parasites on other animals, and while there are tons of examples of that, just know that there are parasites to plants. There are parasites to fungi. Some fungi are parasites. Some protozoans are parasites. We'll talk about animal parasites just because as humans, these are probably the ones we're most familiar with, and honestly, they're some of the coolest ones. And so the one we'll talk about um, is this guy that just popped up. Now, the thing that's a little bit different about parasites versus predators is the relationship is somewhat similar. The parasite and the predator are positively benefiting from this relationship, right? They're getting food. That is a big benefit. Whereas their host, when we're talking about parasites, or their prey, when talking about predators, are negatively impacted. But the difference between parasitism and predation is that with predators, they just straight up kill their prey and consume them. Whereas parasites don't do that. Typically parasites uh, are much, much smaller uh, than the host that they're in. Uh, and then they're also not killing the host 
or at least not killing the host right away. Typically, depends on the parasite, but typically the parasite might need to complete some stage of its life cycle. It might need to reproduce, it might need to grow to a certain stage uh, in that host or on that host. And then once that's completed, if the host dies, then it's not a big deal. But the parasite depends on the host. So if you kill your host, you've just screwed yourself over. Uh, so that's kind of what's different between parasitism and predators. Predators essentially kill their prey right away. Parasites, it's a slow, painful death, if there's death at all. The parasite wants the host to live. It's a never-ending food supply. So the picture that we have down here, um, we have this caterpillar of a moth species. And although it is a caterpillar, it's called the tomato horn worm. But it's not a worm, it is a caterpillar. It will metamorphose later in its life. Now, all of these white things that you see on it are cocoons. They're wasp cocoons. So what happens with this parasitism is we have this wasp, and it's not like the wasp that you and I think of. Take your pinky nail and imagine about half the size of your pinky nail. That's how large these wasps are. You probably wouldn't even notice them, or if you did notice them, you'd see them real quick and be like, oh, it's a gnat or something like that. And what these wasps do is the females will sting these caterpillars. But they don't just sting. When they sting, they lay eggs inside the caterpillars. And those eggs hatch in the larvae, and the larvae grow inside of the tomato hornworm. And when those larvae get large enough and developed enough, they start sprouting from the skin and developing these cocoons that will eventually release at new adult wasps. So totally dreadful. Um, at the end, <laughs> at the end of the day, essentially when these cocoons start forming is when this caterpillar more or less dies, but it's alive while those larvae are crawling around inside of it. It's pretty gory, and when you watch this video, you're going to feel kind of bad uh, for this hornworm, but this parasite is actually a wonderful help for farmers, particularly tomato farmers. Right? If you have all these pests, all these tomato hornworms eating your tomato plants, one of your options is to use a pesticide. So you're introducing chemicals into the environment. Or you can use a natural predator like this parasitic wasp uh, that can control this population through its gross parasitism ways. Um, I don't want you guys to freak out that this wasp can sting you and then you're going to get them growing on you. Like most parasites, these wasps are very, very specific. They can only lay their eggs in a tomato hornworm because that has the perfect conditions for their eggs to develop. Now, before moving on to the next one, this video just kind of shows some imagery of this parasitism. Really cool, kind of gross. Uh, so go ahead and pause here, click on the link that's popping up with this video, and then come on back.